Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, Facebook Live. Good evening, conference call line. Good evening on all other platforms where we may appear tonight. We thank God for this 22nd day of the third month of the 22nd year of the third decade of this century and third millennium, March 22nd. We thank God for the privilege of study on this night where we will go deeper in God's word. Our focus tonight will be the 13th chapter of Luke, especially verses one through nine. First, let us pray. Gracious and ever living God, our savior, we do thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you, God, that you have brought us one step closer to our destiny. We thank you for this day. For some, this day has been easy. For some, this day has been a tremendous challenge. So some of us can say hallelujah, but some of us have to go deeper and say hallelujah anyhow. We thank you for bringing us to this place of study and reflection. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light into our pathway. We ask that you illumine our way through your word. Bless all who will tune in in real time and those who will be blessed by this study later. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, and I'm assuming that you do, we are going to read Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Word. Your version may read a bit differently, but we are depending on the Holy Spirit of God to help us arrive at the same point of understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish you will all perish as they did. Or the 18 who were killed when the tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are at the halfway point in our Lenten journey, and Jesus is determined and committed to follow through on his assignment. And he is 
in the company of disciples, not merely the 12, but a wider group who have decided to follow him. And he's attempting to help them understand a great principle that still escapes so many of us. Jesus wanted them to understand that they did not have a corner on righteousness or they did not have an immunity against calamity, whether caused by human hands or caused by natural disasters. There is a prevailing common thought among church people that good things happen to people who do good and bad things happen to people who don't do good. And the line between goodness and misfortune is not necessarily a clear demarcation. Bad things do happen to good people. And sometimes bad people get away with things for a while. And Jesus wanted his followers to understand that they could not compare themselves to another group of people who were going through travail, trouble, disaster, devastation, as if they were not going to ultimately have to experience something similar before the conclusion of their earthly journey. Everybody has a turn with trouble. Everybody has a turn with sorrow. Everybody has a turn with misfortune. And there is no getting around that. Absolutely, positively, no way around it. We have to go through it. So this lesson, at least the, the first part of, of this pericope or passage, is a great teaching for us to embrace and not be so quick to judge other people because of what they may be experiencing in the moment. We must resist the spirit of self-righteousness. I said Sunday that one of the things that has always been curious to me is when something happens to a person and they have, as a result, a transition from this life, the first thing that many people ask is what happened to them? What did they die of or from? As if that knowledge is going to keep us from dying. We may not die by the means that another person does. But unless the rapture comes, and that's a whole teaching for another time, unless those of us who are alive are caught up in midair, according to 1 Thessalonians, we too will have to face that fateful day. I'm not saying that we can't learn lessons from others. I'm not suggesting that there is no value in 
knowledge. But I don't want us to fall into the trap of half-baked understanding as if that is going to shield us from our own trouble. This is why Jesus said, if you think that those who were slaughtered by Pilate's hands and those who were covered, if you will, by the fall of a tower were not as good as you, think again. <laughs> he says, unless you and I get ourselves together, we'll perish too. Perish without hope. Perish without a relationship. Perish without a real future. So this is a cautionary teaching of preparation. And I realize that underlying this is uh, coming against and battling the spirit of procrastination. I know that I am in Procrastination Anonymous. <laughs> And it has been uh, the bane of my existence for many years of my life. And I thank God that I have lived long enough to shake much of it off. But it is still with me. And I confess that. And I pray that you will pray with me. And if you're in the same camp that I am, we'll pray for each other. That we can be prepared fully and freely for our future. Now, I know that the emphasis on this particular text may be apocalyptic or end time in its presentation, but there are a lot of things in life that you and I miss out on because we're just not prepared. Never forget having a conversation with a stranger in Baltimore many years ago. And uh, we were walking uh, around the harbor late at night. And uh, he asked me if I knew the definition of luck. And of course, being a Christian, <laughs> I told him I didn't believe in luck. He said, okay, he says, uh, you're entitled to that. But let me give you a definition that may uh, help you. He says, I have come to learn that luck is preparation meeting opportunity. I was never the same. Uh, I still may not use the word luck, but that gentleman who walked into my life as I was walking, getting some exercise, and then walked out of my life and uh, I've never seen again, deposited a jewel in me. And I had to struggle with that idea and, and I embrace it. I realize that if you and I are not prepared when opportunity comes, we can't take advantage of it. So some people may call it readiness. I'm not quite certain that many of us are ever fully ready for some of the things that we have to face and certainly the ultimate thing that we all must face as we transition from the natural to the immortal, 
But I know this, if we daily prepare ourselves, thinking that this is the first day of the rest of our lives and simultaneously thinking that this might be the last day that I have here, we'll have a different attitude about everything. We'll have a different attitude about ourselves. We'll have a different attitude about how we treat other people. We'll have a different attitude about taking care of business and taking advantage of those open doors and ways that are made. Being curious enough to, to go beneath the surface beyond the ordinary so that we can get the full measure of life and we don't have to spend the rest of our lives in the valley of regret. So it's time to be proactive and not merely reactive. And I think that these who were with Christ Jesus on this day uh, were looking for some excuse to continue to live ordinary lives by looking at the misfortune that other people were going through and thinking because it wasn't them that they were somehow better. And Jesus said, get rid of that thinking. It's only by the grace of God. It's only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God that you and I are still moving and breathing. <laughs> that, that's it. That's all. I think that all of us know someone who has left planet Earth who by nature was better than we are by practice. Yeah. Some good people wish they were still here. They could make the world even better. And then we look at some people who are still hanging around and creating chaos. And there's not a one of us who is tempted to ask God to give those folks an earlier checkout. Yes. So, so that's, that is the struggle. We, we, we've got to move past uh, this understanding, this simplistic understanding about life. And we've got to focus on our own preparation. And we've got to model it every single day. There isn't a goal that any of us will reach suddenly or instantaneously. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes energy. It takes prayer. It takes fasting. It takes self-denial, it, it takes focus, it takes discipline, it takes all of that to get where we ultimately want to go. And there's no use being envious or jealous of people who want life more than we do. and subsequently achieve more than we do. It's not that we can't. We can. Philippians 4.13 says we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. But we've got to want it and then we've got to exercise our faith. Yes, we do. We have to exercise it. 
It can't be just a once in a while situation. We've got to spend time. I was speaking with a friend uh, Sunday and, and, and the key to victory in this life is spending time with God. And we live in a world of great distraction. And, and we can get caught up. And, and I know that there is a lot on the news. There's a lot going on. Uh, whether it's going on in Europe, Africa, Asia, uh, wherever it's going on, it's going on. Whether it's happening in Washington, D.C., whether it's happening in the city of Detroit, even if it's happening in our families, we still have to make time. We've got to take time to be holy. <laughs> We've got to speak oft, often with the Lord. And that's got to be a daily discipline. And it doesn't come easily. But if we really want to know more about God and more about ourselves, we will find the time. We find the time for any other thing we want. Yes, we do. We know how to be busy when we don't want to do something. And when we want to do something, Lord have mercy, we will clear our calendars to do just that. And it is this level, this is what I love about the season of Lent. We can go deeper in our relationship with God if we just take the time and turn away from some of the distractions. And focus on the most meaningful relationship in life. And that is with our maker, our keeper, our sustainer. The one who opens doors and makes ways. The one who gives us new mercies every morning. And if we make that investment while we have the time, while we have the chance, when we get to the end of what this is called, we call it life, natural life, what comes after this is not going to be such a mystery. <laughs> We won't be ashamed of the gospel and we won't be afraid of the future. So it, it, <laughs> what Jesus did, Jesus turned this entire conversation on its head and gave his followers something really to consider. Because church folks gossip, we do. And, and gossip is not <laughs> gender specific. Everybody's got something to say about somebody else. Everybody's in somebody else's business. Everybody has an opinion. And if we're not careful, we're so wrapped up in everything else and everybody else's life that our lives go wanting. Then we discover one day that we've wasted a lot of time. And then we become bitter and we take it out on everybody else. And it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't. So let's now go on to verses six through nine because I really didn't get a chance to touch upon that Sunday. Jesus tells this parable. You know, I did say that we live in a season of probation, that uh, we are between uh, the enslavement 
of our past and the liberation of our future. And that God is giving us in this period a chance to autocorrect. And, and I don't want to seem uh, too uh, technological in my approach to it. You know, uh, uh, God gives us another chance. God gives us a chance to uh, refresh, to renew, and to restore. But notice, if you will, it doesn't happen merely on our own efforts. And that's what I love about this, this, this verses 6 through 9. The owner of the vineyard, and, and you may have an appreciation for this. I can only tell you what I experienced uh, when I went to what we call the Holy Lands, the convergence of Southeast Asia, uh, Southwest Asia, Northeast Africa, and the Southern Mediterranean of Europe, that, that, that great convergence of three continents that is called the Holy Land. It is certainly rooted and grounded. It is it's situated in Africa, in Northern Africa. And I noticed that uh, the landscape, I know we, we were taught in the Bible that uh, the land that the Israelites entered was flowing with milk and honey it was certainly abundant in comparison to the desert of sin where they wandered for 40 years. But the arable land, the land that can be worked for produce, for vegetation, is not that available. There are patches of land in Palestine, in what is called Israel now, uh, that, uh, that, that yields an abundance. But a lot of the land is stubborn and rocky and semi-arid. And yes, there is snow on Mount Hebron and that, but uh, in, in the lowlands, uh, the snow doesn't fall that often. Uh, the climate is very similar to northern and southern California, if you're familiar with that. You know, northern California, uh, especially the Bay Area region where I was nurtured, has essentially two seasons, a dry season and a rainy season, six months where we can expect rain and six months where we don't expect rain. It may rain, but uh, it's negligible. It's not abundant. So because of that environment and because water is not readily available, whatever is grown needs to produce. And this farmer uh, had planted grapes, and grapes love dry, hot weather. Uh, they, they love the rainy season. That's when uh, the grapes are typically dormant, and, and you know, the vines uh, store up the water. And then in the dry season, uh, the, the leaves spring forth, and, and there are buds and, and, and tiny flowers, and from those flowers, are, are orbs or bunches of fruit that we delight in, we delight to eat, we delight to drink, some of us, grapes. So this farmer decided that he was also going to plant uh, a few trees uh, that would also produce fruit so that he could get maximum usage out of his land. Now, a grown fig tree 
or even a growing fig tree takes up a lot of space and its roots search for the water table. And uh, so if, if it's not bearing fruit, it's in the way. It could be moved or cut down. The wood could be used and, and that land could be made available for another crop, maybe more grapes. Because this, this farmer is, is not just feeding his family. I mean, he's farming for a living. So when the tree reaches maturity, the first year that the tree is supposed to bear fruit, and it doesn't take a long time for fig trees uh, to grow and bear. It doesn't take them 20 or 30 years. Uh, they're supposed to be up and at them. <laughs> so the first year, there were just leaves. Tree was pretty. And the farmer didn't say anything. Second year, tree was even bigger. The leaves were even prettier. And he looked under the leaves, looked at the branches, thought he would find some Kadota figs, something delectable and delicious. No figs. So he comes the third year. <laughs> and the tree is still barren, but very leafy. It looks like it ought to be bearing fruit. Yeah, that's the way some of the saints look. We look very leafy. We look like we ought to be doing something. <laughs> we look like we ought to be productive. But all we're doing is pushing out leaves and no fruit. The farmer says to the gardener, cut this sucker down. Now, this is ridiculous. I've given this tree three years to produce after it reached maturity and it has done nothing. And see, the other thing is a fig tree doesn't need another fig tree to uh, cross pollinate. Figs are fascinating. Figs self pollinate. So uh, this fig tree didn't have an excuse. This fig tree didn't need a companion. <laughs> it was supposed to produce on its own. And it had not. And the farmer said, this land is too valuable. And this, this tree is taking up too much room. And, and now the roots are running all into the vineyard and, and sucking up the little moisture that the grapes should get. <coughs> Cut it down. And that's justice talking. But the gardener who is tending the field speaks to the owner in the voice of mercy and entreated on behalf of the fig tree. <laughs> Stood in the gap for a tree that should have been bearing fruit in its season. And representing mercy, the gardener said, listen, let me work with the tree. Maybe the tree has not had enough fertilizer. Let me dig around the tree and uh, give it more nutrients. Let me see if I can stimulate the tree. Maybe I can talk to the tree and, and, and encourage the tree. Let me work with the tree. Give me one year. And if the tree doesn't produce, I'll help you cut it down. Now, I know that's not what the Bible said, but, but you get the gist. The Bible just says, this particular version just said, says you can cut it down. But, but I know it would be 
the gardener's responsibility, not the farmer. But I don't know about you, but I'm glad that uh, I've got Jesus in my life who is willing to work with me. <laughs> work with me to make me fruitful and productive. Work with you. Because truth be told, most of us on this in this study tonight are old enough to have done some wonderful things and we've not lived up to our potential. We, we, we haven't. And, and there, I, I know we look good. We look like we've got it made. We look like we've got it going on. <laughs> We're very leafy. But, but we haven't yet produced And, and if it were left up to justice, we would have been wiped out a long time ago. But mercy stands in the gap for us and says, listen, let me, let me, let, let, let me work with this tree. Let me work with this person. Maybe uh, they, they, they'll listen. Maybe uh, they'll, they'll get it. Maybe they'll feel your spirit and your presence. Maybe they'll be grateful for another chance. And they'll start producing. They'll start maximizing their potential. They'll start living up to their purpose. And, and they won't spend wasted time in other people's business because they've got a lot of business to take care of. They've got to be, they have been wired. You and I have been wired to be blessings. I mean, there's nothing wrong with admiring other people. There's nothing wrong with, with that. It, it, there, there's nothing, absolutely nothing but but when we admire somebody and we 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 look take an honest look at ourselves there really isn't anything that somebody else is doing and i'm not saying that we have to do the very same thing i'm just saying with what god has given us we too can be productive we too can be a blessing we too can make a difference We too can be all that God is calling us to be. But it takes a reshifting and a refocusing of our priorities. And sometimes when we make that shift and refocus, we're no longer as popular because people will feel uncomfortable. They'll feel as though we're outgrowing them. And, 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 and I know that that's a difficult experience too, but you can't let somebody else hold you back and hold you down and keep you from reaching your goal. You can love them, but you got to still grow. And if they want to grow with you, to God be the glory. If they don't want to grow with you, you pray for them, but you keep growing. Because there are some people that God wants you and I to reach. There are some people that, uh, that we've got we've got a date with greatness. Yes, we do. So I, I love this lesson. Uh, this is this is one of my favorite lessons. Because it, it does two things for me. I hope it, it does something for you. But it does two things for me. It keeps me from being presumptuous about my status and my position in life. Just because somebody else is catching hell, just because somebody else is going through a rough patch, that doesn't mean that I am better than that person. As a matter of fact, if I'm spiritually mature, I should pray for that person. 
And if I have any level of relationship, I should root and encourage them, not judge them. Because when we point one finger, three are pointing back at us. And number two, God is merciful toward us. Lord, have mercy. We thank God for Jesus. Because this life could be just cut and dry. Either you get it or you don't. Either it works for you or it doesn't. But we thank and praise God for recovery. We thank God for restoration. We thank God for grace. We thank God for not just one more chance. <laughs> We run out of fingers and toes when we start counting all of the chances that God has given us. But I want to let you know one thing. When you draw close to God, God will quicken your spirit and will open your eyes and you'll be able to take advantage of more opportunities because you will see more. You will know more. You will feel more. You will hear more. And when you let Jesus lead you, you've got victory. I know somebody can shout with me tonight. You got victory. But you've got to dig a little deeper and you've got to spend time with God and then let the spirit of God dig deeply in you. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, <laughs> boy, you talking about dunamis, dynamite, power. He says, you can ask anything according to my will and it shall be given. Who wouldn't want that kind of power? Who wouldn't want that kind of power? But you've got to want it and you've got to invest in it. You've got to make some sacrifices to make the investment, don't you? I mean, it would be nice if we had it like that, if we had the resources Let's say we wanted to take a, a trip to Paris, France, and all we had to do was make a phone call, give a credit card number, show up at the airport with no bags, and go. But who of us is living on that level? And thank God, if we lived on that level, we wouldn't be sensitive to the needs of others, and we wouldn't grow. So if you're going to take a great trip, you've got to plan. You've got to plan. You've got to plan months in advance. You, you've got to set aside the resources. You, you've got to get your mind wrapped around it. You, if you don't have a passport, you've got to apply for a passport. Then you've got to get a visa to get into the country of France. And, uh, and, and, and then you've got to make sure uh, that, that you are properly vaccinated. And, and it goes on and on and on. <laughs> and that doesn't happen overnight. That's an investment of time, effort, and energy. And if you start in enough time, because I promise you, you'll run into something you run into a glitch, you run into a detour, you run into a hiccup as you plan for a long journey. But if you take your time and, and make preparation and plan with enough time, you can even factor in the twists and the turns and you won't miss your trip. 
You just, you won't. I promise you, you won't. And the trip will be more rewarding and more fulfilling because you really put your best effort into the preparation. And that preparation will lead to peace. That peace will give way to joy. And you'll have an experience of a lifetime. We just have to stop being last minute people. <laughs> we miss out on too much waiting until the last minute. And there are some things that are just never going to happen for us if we're unprepared at the last minute. So if we can make preparation to live a victorious life, we can also prepare for life after this life. We can do both. And we can have peace and joy about it. And as I said before, we don't have to be afraid. Isn't God good? Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you and we praise you. We thank you for teaching us not to look down on others as they are experiencing trouble, not using their discomfort and inconvenience as some platform that makes us feel good about ourselves. We thank you and we praise you that into, that into each life a little rain falls. We all have our turn and our time. But with you, with us, in us, on us, for us, we will have victory even in times of trouble. We'll have the blessed assurance in knowing that we will get through it. We will overcome. And we thank you for it. Then, God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. This is a reverberating theme. We'll embrace it again this coming Sunday. And you exemplify grace and mercy on the cross at Calvary. Where you took our sins and nailed them to the cross so that we would bear them no more. And we say praise the Lord. Thank you for wanting to work with us. Thank you for not giving up on us doesn't matter our age. It doesn't matter our current situation. You are absolutely committed to our victory. You're for us. Now help us be for us. And for you. May someone make a commitment tonight that they're going to take time every day and spend some time in your presence. Find a quiet place. Find a situation. Maybe through a walk, maybe through exercise. There are a variety of ways where we can be with you. 
without the noise and the distractions. You will reveal sacred secrets. You'll help us understand life better. You'll help us understand others better. And yes, you will help us understand us better. And we'll give you the glory and we'll thank you for fearfully and wonderfully making us. Thank you for giving us purpose. Thank you for placing a crown of confidence above our heads that we are straining daily to grow tall enough to wear. Somebody needs you, Lord. Somebody's been crying, somebody's sick, somebody's lonely. Someone is economically insecure. Someone doesn't have enough food. Someone's mind is confused. Someone is filled with hate and rage and doubts and fears. We ask you, God, to step into every situation. Step into every grieving heart, every broken heart. We know that you're a miracle worker, that you, you can pull people out of the rubble of life. Go all over this planet. Look upon your people with kindness. Remind every tyrant and every dictator and every despot that you are God and beside you there is none other. That the earth is yours. Let freedom ring. Justice and freedom. Do it all for your glory. We thank you and we praise you and we love you in Jesus' name. Thank you for the encouragement tonight. Yes, we can. Yes, we can and yes, we will in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. Let me give you a little music. And then I'll get out of your way. I played this Sunday morning and I just want to play it one more time uh, so that it can get in your spirit like it has gotten into mine. The Myra Walker Singers, Jesus Christ is the way. To 
everyone. <laughs> yes, sir. And say Jesus Christ. songs one of the great songs of the spirit I pray that you have been encouraged tonight let's move upward and onward and take advantage of every opportunity that God presents to us and draw closer to God God will draw closer to us and then, whatever happens, everything will be all right. <laughs> I hope that you will rest well. Join the fellowship hour on Thursday night on the conference call line. Prayer on Friday on the conference call line, 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Thank God for those who tune in from week to week in Detroit, around the state, around the nation, and uh, around the world. We thank and praise God for the privilege that is afforded us. Rest well and know that God 
is with you. In Jesus' name, amen.